Rapamycin is very popular in the anti-aging paradigm, so let's have a look at what it is, what it offers, and what the trade-offs are, because, well, it's always good to have all the data. Rapamycin is also known as sirolimus. It's a compound with immunosuppressant functions in humans. It inhibits the activation of T cells and B cells by reducing their sensitivity to the signaling molecule interleukin-2, and thus it appears to extend lifespan by inhibiting mTOR. It was a curious substance discovered in soil that had been scooped up on Easter Island during a 1964 Canadian research expedition. Scientists studying disease there noticed that people didn't pick up tetanus via their feet as they would expect, and they figured the ground held some secrets, but nobody expected to find this one. The soil sat in frozen storage in a University in Montreal lab for another five years until a researcher who was searching for useful compounds came across a molecule of interest. It was isolated as a compound in 1972, however it took until 1999 for it to be approved as a medication for immune system suppression following organ transplants. By the mid-2000s, rapamycin had become increasingly of interest when it was found to increase the lifespan of worms and yeast, and in a 2009 study it extended the life expectancy of mice by 28% for males and 38% for females. Additionally, they also seem to have more energy, and all this could translate into more than a decade of better years for humans. But as always, there was a catch. Rapamycin is not exactly benign. In high doses, rapamycin suppresses your immune system. It is for people who have undergone organ transplants to keep their bodies from rejecting the donated organ, and it can have some less pleasant side effects. In roughly 5% of patients in clinical trials, these side effects were bad enough for them to quit the treatment and to have it listed as a drug that comes with serious or life-threatening risks. Risks like infections, pneumonia, and cancer, with common side effects such as mouth sores, chest pain, and increased susceptibility to infection, and the possible development of lymphoma and other malignancies due to immunosuppression. So, just something to remember if it is something you have considered. As for its longevity benefits, these come from it inhibiting mTOR and essentially tricking the body into thinking that it's in a state of calorie deprivation. This leads to the cellular workers consuming your oldest, weakest cell parts and parts of senescent cells. We can get into those later, but basically, they are the cells that no longer divide and are thought to spur ageing and maybe even drive cancer. They are one of the hallmarks of ageing. What this means is that rapamycin could give you all the benefits of fasting without, well, fasting. The benefits to this are the body decides to stop the growth thing and do a repair thing instead. This means it sets about renewing what it can save and disposing of what it cannot. However, as this study shows, in mice there appears to be no longevity gain, even though mTOR saw a significant lowering, so as always, it appears we do need more studies. Here we see a study from 2014, and it shows that after taking a reduced dose of 25% for six weeks, this immunosuppressant drug actually boosted immunity levels. And as with this study, we can see that mTOR inhibition improves the immune function in the elderly and a faltering immune system is known to be a major factor in the ageing process. So finding the threads to tie it all together is still going to take a bit more nailing down, it appears. In addition to the studies on rapamycin in yeast, worms, flies and mice, in 2014 scientists began work on dogs and they found that those on the drug showed signs of younger hearts and a reversal of age-related cardiac issues. So indeed, some more conflicting data to be sure, but this is down to bad study design, looking for the wrong things, or is it just one of the many anomalies that can crop up from small studies or when trying to project what happens with small rodents into real-life humans? 
More work needs to be done, and it is the subject of many studies and significant interest, so we may soon have some better answers. We must not forget to treat it with caution, for there are downsides, although these are more of concern to patients taking higher doses after surgery. Medicinal usage for ageing would meet a much lower level, but still. Also, it is not always easily obtained through trusted channels, so there is a risk of contamination, or even it not being what you want. It has also been shown to be toxic to the kidneys over extended periods of time. However, when compared to other immune system suppressors, it is chosen for its low toxicity in this regard. More concerning is with bacterial infections in up to 5% of patients, which can be aggravated and not held in check so well, needing quick antibiotic treatment to stop it running out of control due to a weakened immune system. And then we have antibiotics themselves, which are not something to be taken more than when you absolutely need them, as they decimate your microbiome and gut flora. As with all things, awareness of both sides of the equation is most important. If you do wish to try it, just look at low doses and intermittent use, and who knows what will be shown by the wealth of new trials that are currently underway or in planning, so we will have a much better idea if it's right and how it impacts various systems within the body. Anyway, whilst you're here, why not try this video? And if you've already seen that one, try this one. And before you go, hit the subscribe button and click like, please. That would be much appreciated. As always, thank you for dropping by.